Hello, everyone, and welcome to episode 22 of the Horn Call podcast. My name is James Bolden. I'm the publications editor for the International Horn Society and your host. My guest today is a friend, colleague, and also my boss. Uh, Julia Bircher is the executive director of the International Horn Society, and I think you're really going to enjoy our conversation today. Um, Julia has a very interesting career path that led her to her current position with the IHS. She's got uh, an amazing amount of um, enthusiasm and excitement about all things related to the IHS and the horn, and I really, really enjoyed speaking with her. Uh, A couple of announcements as we head into uh, at least the summer months here in the United States. We're gearing up for um, the 54th International Horn Symposium at Texas A&M University, Kingsville. I hope that you are making your plans to attend that symposium if if, uh, the travel is possible for you. Uh, Looking forward to seeing everyone there. And without further delay, here's my conversation with Julia Bircher. Thanks so much, Julia, for speaking with me today, and uh, I think this is going to be a really fun conversation. Um, What I always do for my guests is I give you a chance to talk a little bit about how you ended up where you are. So you are the executive director of the International Horn Society, which is a big job, and you are doing a magnificent job at it, if I may say so. Um, And uh, I I think that's the absolute truth. But if if you want to talk a little bit about how you ended up where you are. It's it's a a very interesting career path, I think. One that will be interesting to folks who are maybe more familiar with like, oh, okay, you you get a job in an orchestra or you go teach at a university or you teach private lessons. Your path has been a little bit different. It has. Thank you, James. I'm so excited to talk to you. I, uh, I'm, as you know, I'm so enthusiastic about the Horn Society and, um, and my path has been convoluted. (laughs) Um, But it just makes me appreciate this organization even more. Uh, I have a music degree, I feels like a thousand lifetimes ago, from Cincinnati. Um, It's a Bachelor of Arts in Horn. Um, And my intent was to get this music degree, which I loved every minute of that degree. But then I was going to go into... A, um, a master's program, which is, it was a dual degree, business administration and arts administration. And it was, uh, it still is offered at the University of Cincinnati. It's a great program. Um, but when I finished my bachelor's, I decided I needed a break. I was mm-hmm. tired, you know, and I'm just going to, I'm just going to take a break for a couple of years and then go back to school. And at the time I was working at the Cincinnati Symphony Orchestra part-time in the library, which again, fantastic job. Boy, did I learn a lot. I had no idea of <laughs> what it took to put music on the stage. Right. Wonderful job. Loved it. That uh, I was able to leverage that into a full-time job as an administrative assistant in the administrative offices for the symphony, working for the president and the general manager, working with all the guest artists that come through, with the board members, um, just the behind the scenes of the symphony. Again, another incredible job. I'm so lucky. But what I learned at the time was that arts administration is not for me. I do not have the, I just, I, I thought, boy, am I glad that I didn't go straight into that degree <laughs> because <laughs> whew, that would have been rough. So then I was at a loose end and uh, I ended up getting a job in the logistics industry in 1999 tracking and tracing, using software to track and trace rail cars from their origin to their destination. And Hmm. before I got the job, I wouldn't have even known that, I mean, you get stuck at a railway crossing when you're driving somewhere and it's annoying because you're stuck and you have to wait for these cars to go by. Well, there is a whole industry to make that happen. And uh, boy, is it complicated. I have been in that industry since 1999 in the in software to make railroads go in some form or fashion. I've been doing that and it has kept me stimulated and interested. I learn every day because the railroad is ridiculously complicated and I love it. So, but, you know, with with every career, it kind of starts approaching a, uh, you know, do I want to do this forever type of a thing? Mm -hmm. And. 
at some point I dropped my membership to the Horn Society because I was not, I never stopped playing. Mm -hmm. um, I, I was very active in Cincinnati in the community theater uh, world, which I loved. I played in some orchestras and it, you know, I never stopped playing, but I did drop my membership. But then I picked it up again and I always read the Horn Calls at cover to cover. Mm -hmm. And it was kind of my way of keeping that part of my life alive because I, the horn was my stress relief, is my stress relief. I just love it. I, I've invested way too much time in it. <laughs> it's part of me. You know, we all feel this sure. way, I think. Um, so I picked up my horn membership again and was reading the horn call and I saw this job description for executive director. Now, I had seen Heidi Vogel's name all over everything, all over those... Uh, AC ballot cards and mm -hmm. membership cards and, you know, for years. And I, it hit me, oh my gosh, she's retiring. And this is her job position. Well, the job position that was posted, I felt like was written for me. And so then I was like, I think I want to apply for this. This is crazy. Is this my thing where I leave corporate life and go to the, you know, do something different? Um, yes. I, well, I didn't leave my corporate life. I'm still doing that. Uh, I've been able to make it work. But uh, I applied for the job, and it's the best thing that I've done for myself in forever. I mean, it, it's it's been it's been exactly what my soul needed <laughs> to 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 get some fulfillment in a way that I hadn't been getting before. And so that's my path. It's it's. Uh, it's crazy. And, and I could get into a lot more detail, but I think we would lose a lot of listeners if I did. No, no. I, I, that, <laughs> <laughs> that's great to hear. Uh, who did you study with at, at Cincinnati? My primary teacher there was Dr. Stephen Gross. Oh, and, yeah. yeah. And I also I also studied with Michael Hatfield. He would come over and from mm -hmm. Indiana and, um, mm -hmm. and and give lessons. And I also took lessons from Paul Austin. Oh, yeah. Um, because my freshman year, I was actually an English major. Okay. And I, but I wanted to keep playing. And so I took lessons out of the prep program that they had. And Paul was a DMA candidate. Okay. And he was my teacher. He taught me natural horn. That was the first time I'd ever played a natural horn. And now I own one that he taught me on. I bought it from him. I love, love, love it. Bought Anarchy's book. I'm, I'm took lessons from James Hampson. I'm all in on natural horn. Um, but I took lessons from him and he's the one that really, really nurtured my desire to become a music major and helped guide me into that, that that's where I needed to be. Oh, that's awesome to hear. And, uh, Hey, uh, this is gonna, this podcast will come out a little bit later than when we're recording it just because of the, sure. the schedule and things, but you know, the, the, the Super Bowl just happened recently. And so yes. you know, it yes. was a heartbreaker for Cincinnati, oh. but you know, I, I work with a colleague who's, who's from that area. And he said, Hey, that was an amazing season for Cincinnati, you know, no matter what happened at the well, end. Well, not just that, but the, um, the football team for the university, they, they, they're, Sports in Cincinnati this year has been very, very good. <laughs> <So> <laughs> yeah, it, it was a long time coming. And it, I, I struggled with the Super Bowl, though. I lived in Cincinnati for 14 years. So, yay, go Bengals. But I live in Toledo. So we have the, the Detroit Lions, which are uh. perennial. Oh, boy. Come on, guys. <laughs> but Stafford you know, the, the quarterback of the LA Rams came from Detroit. So I, oh. I was happy for him that, you know, he got a little bit of validation in a Super Bowl ring out of it. So. Sure. No, I just <laughs> thought we'd had, we had to make that plug since, yes, uh, thank since you. Cincinnati, Cincinnati came <laughs> I can't, up. I can't take any, you know, I did enjoy watching them. Uh, I'm happy, <laughs> happy for the town. It's a, it's a good thing, even though they yeah. didn't win, but. It was good. <laughs> um, so uh, we can talk about Chile later, but uh, you know, yeah. <laughs> So I, I have relatives from Cincinnati, so we, I know I yes. know about all the skyline chili and all of that. Yes. But um, so if we could talk just a little bit about and, you know, you can we can get as far into the weeds or not as you want. But I think it would be really good for people to know. And I certainly didn't know this when I was, you know, a, a sort of a rank and file member of the IHS. What what does the executive director do? And it's I mean, the amount of things that the people behind the scenes make happen without almost anyone realizing it, but that if it stopped working, you would know immediately, mm. you know, it's that kind of a thing where the IHS doesn't run without the executive director, without the webmaster, Dan Phillips, without people behind the scenes doing things. And I think, I think it would be really great for people to, to kind of have an idea of sort of what your general responsibilities are as executive director and how that, 
uh, works with the members of the advisory council and the IHS president and, and all of that kind of stuff. Yes, it's it's a lot. And, and you, as publications editor, have now had a lot of exposure into trying to make this thing go. Um, I describe my job as I really just try to keep the wheels on the bus. Uh, that's mm-hmm. my primary focus. And what that means to me is paying the bills, doing the taxes, all of the things that the foundational fundamental things that need to happen to make any organization or business go. Mm -hmm. But we have checks and balances with that. So that means that I have to coordinate communication. And so for example, when we publish the horn call three times a year, Mm -hmm. um, I work with Dan Phillips. I kind of do this on my own now, but I, I download the member database to make sure that I have a, an updated current list of everybody who should get a physical copy of that in the mail. That takes me probably a half a day, four hours to, to, to scrub that list and make sure I've got everybody that should get Mm -hmm. their horn call. Um, You know, I, I try to update addresses if I get them. Elaine Braun, our membership coordinator also does a lot of heavy lifting with keeping the database as clean as possible Mm -hmm. with the most current information. So you probably have seen in all of the horn calls and e-newsletters, if you have an address change, please (laughs) That's Please right. Yep. <laughs> yeah. So, so, you know, so, so working with that um, and then, then when, when the horn call is, is sent, we, we, we work with printers and we work with freight forwarders to get the, uh, to get it mailed and everything internationally and domestically. And so when I get those invoices in, we have a payment approval system where I attach a copy to that and send it electronically to Johanna Lundy, our treasurer. She Mm -hmm. approves it. So that's part of the check and balance to make sure that I'm not just paying bills without (laughs) anyone's, you know, knowledge. Right. Yeah. Yeah. The financial side. Yeah. (laughs) Financial side. Um, And then when she approves that, I go ahead and I write the check or, or do the, however, you know, I'm supposed to pay, pay the person. So that's kind of just a real basic workflow of, of starting to make things happen. Um, I use QuickBooks for all of our accounting purposes. We have an accountant firm that specializes in nonprofit organizations who Mm -hmm. right now I am hot and heavy with my man, John there, because we are working on our 990 form. I send him a lot of documentation so that they can do our 990 form, making sure that we are doing everything that is required of us um, with the IRS to keep us in our nonprofit 501c3 status. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, so that's that. You know, that's not very glamorous. But um, one thing, making sure that our trademark, our Trihorn logo, is still trademarked and current. There's there's some maintenance that needs to happen there that I keep track of. Um, and then there's the fun stuff. The We have some committees that do things. We have the budget committee, which mm-hmm. is another oversight into like they they have access to all of our um, bank statements and things like that. Just, you know, so that I'm not the single threaded source of knowledge here. You know, I'm facilitating that, but we have visibility into that. But in a, in a more fun way, how do we allocate our funds? How do we manage our programs to benefit our membership and to serve our mission as well as possible. Mm -hmm. Um, Communicating with the advisory council on things that may need to be updated or changed and policy changes and and keeping things current, like the mission statement. We just, we just modernized that a little bit, cleaned it up, put it, we added a vision Mm -hmm. and we added values this day and age. We really need to have more of a North star. um, And so that people understand what our organization is about and the advisory council approved that, you know, so, so keeping all of that communication together, um, we have our big annual meeting in the summertime, usually around the time of the international symposium where we vote on and, uh, we, we do all of this policy stuff. We take reports from all of the committees and from our area represent area representatives, our country representatives and, and put it all into one big thick book which goes into our archives that's another aspect of things making sure Mm -hmm. that all of our documentation is in our archives at eastman um which was drawn heavily upon jeff snedeker went to the archives to do research for the 50th anniversary commemorative book that that some of the folks listening may have seen um so all of this ties together it's it's a lot of pieces and parts that the executive director does but Mm -hmm. really if i had to boil it down to one thing besides accounting It's just facilitating that communication to make sure that our projects and programs are moving forward the way they should be. 
Mm-hmm. Well, and you, as as you said, you're sort of the the realistic side of things because there's a million different things you could do, but there's mm-hmm. only so much money in the bank and so much human resources to make something happen. And I think it's it, it's been a really uh, eye opening and wonderful experience to watch how okay, I the AC comes up with an idea and then it kind of gets bounced around and bounces back and forth, and then it's okay. Well, if we're going to make this happen, here's what needs to happen, and then at which point, you know. Julia, you come in and it's like, well, okay, this, these are some issues that might or might not impact it. And this is, you know, some things to think about. And, you know, I, it really, it, it doesn't work without you. It doesn't work without the executive director, as you said, helping facilitate things. Because otherwise, yeah, it's I, just, otherwise, it's just a bunch of ideas that... <laughs> it is, it is. So. And, and the problem is, ideas are just such a great source of energy. And, and this community, oh my gosh, the creativity and the ideas and the, it's, it's, uh, a little overwhelming. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and it's my job to be devil's advocate, you know, okay. All right. What is our immediate, um, goal here? You know, like how would Mm -hmm. we work towards this? It was funny in my, well, I thought it was funny when I interviewed for this job, I was, I went to Muncie, Indiana to the Mm -hmm. IHS 50. Mm -hmm. Um, And every question they asked me, I was basically like, well, what does the mission statement tell us to do (laughs) every single time? Because it really is that important that we have to serve our mission and and every idea is is worth exploring. But we Mm -hmm. have to be realistic and we have to work within our means. So that's pretty vital. Well, and, you know, it's 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 no small task to maintain your your status as a nonprofit. I mean, if you don't, if you don't do that, it impacts how the whole organization is run and you know, there's paperwork and things that have to be filed in a timely manner and and all of that stuff. But, um, so I always ask this and I've, I've been, uh, privileged and and blessed to to get to talk with all different kinds of people on this podcast. And whenever the opportunity presents itself for someone has, who has, been in and out of the field of music, I always ask, the first question was, so coming from your training as a musician into a different industry, logistics and, and you know, um, moving freight and that sort of thing, what were some of the big differences and how had your training as a musician uh, maybe given you some skills that you could put to use in that in that particular role? So that's the first question related to this. I, uh, so the company that I got the second company that I worked for in logistics. So Mm -hmm. I had first started working in logistics in Cincinnati and I left Mm -hmm. a company there and I moved to Atlanta, Georgia uh, to work for a company called RMI rail car management. And they are the software providers of uh, the operation systems for close to 470 short line and regional railroads in North America. It's a huge software system. And actually, I still technically work for RMI, but we've been bought and sold like three or four times since then. (laughs) So it's like corporate America. Right. But I remember the moment when I got the job because I flew down there and I had all these interviews with people. It was one of these crazy days where I flew in the morning, had interviews, went out to lunch with a bunch of people, had more interviews and then flew home that night. Mm -hmm. It was exhausting. But I, one of my interviews was with the vice president of operations. And he asked me a question that was something along the lines of, if you are presented with a very complicated thing to learn, um, how do you go about learning this thing without, if you don't have a lot of guidance? Mm. Now, what that should have been was a red flag, because if this is a very complicated software system and they don't do training on it very well. (laughs) (laughs) But here's what my answer was. I said, I said, I'm a trained musician and I have been trained to learn a piece of music And usually what I do is I just kind of play through it first, which is, you know, you could argue both sides of the, of whether or not you should do that. But then I start to really practice it and I, I get it down to the smallest part that I can play Mm -hmm. one measure. I can play this measure one note. Mm -hmm. Then I play a note on either side of that until I have it right. And then I play notes on either side of those and keep building out. So I break it down to its smallest part and then I build it back up until I can do the whole. Mm-hmm. And I, I swear, James, I could see, I could see his brain click. And I know that that's when I got that job because as soon as I flew home the next day, I had a job offer. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. So I, I, I cannot overstate how much my music training helped me in every aspect of my corporate life. Um, 
I have been on, I don't even know how many teams to do certain tasks and certain projects, some big, some small. Being able to play nicely with others and to mm -hmm. listen to others is a real skill that I learned by being a musician. Am I perfect at it? No, but I'm way ahead of the game. Some people that I've worked with, <laughs> you right. know, um, but every aspect listening, I know what I need to do to make my part go. Mm -hmm. I know what I need to do to make my job to run a railroad, but I need to listen to where things might need to be fixed, or I need to listen to hear when, uh, wow, this is a really great opportunity. We should go do that listening. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I could go on and on about how my musical training served me in a non-musical career. And I think that if anyone who has had any musical training at all sat down and really thought about it, they would come up with a list of things as well. Mm -hmm. Well, and music is inherently collaborative. And we kind of, we take that for granted sometimes. And then we, you know, if we interact with people not in music, it's like, what do you mean you don't want to work together as a team to, right? to do something <laughs> <laughs> better than individually yes. could happen. So yeah, it's a, uh, no, I, 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 I love that answer. Um, and then, so on the other side of that coin is when you took over this job with the IHS, did, was there anything you found coming from your career with RMI, with logistics, with, you know, being sort of very detail oriented like that and, and seeing how pieces fit together? Cause that to me, I imagine is like how a railroad works. It's just all of these like, mm -hmm. <laughs> separate things. And so uh, in, in what ways was that helpful to your job with the IHS? Well, kind of tangentially, I, I was required to get my master's degree by my employer, uh, an MBA. And so mm -hmm. 20 years after my undergrad, I finally went back to school. And uh, I'm very grateful for the education, but I had actually been laid off and I had to re-interview for my own job. It was, it was a oh, lovely wow. time. Um, <laughs> <laughs> again, corporate America, take it sure. as you will. So I got my master's of business administration and really the biggest skills that I could bring over are the accounting, the things mm. that I learned in accounting. I was really surprised at how much I loved accounting because I'm not really a numbers person. I've never been a math person, even though music theory. Oh, mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, so the, the accounting classes that I took, I, my prof I had the same professor for accounting 101 and 102 or whatever they were, whatever the numbers were. Mm -hmm. And she actually said, Hey, have you thought about going into a career of an accounting? That's how much I responded to this class. Wow. And I was able to really relate better to my corporate accountants whenever we had meetings, which was frequently um, about what they needed to do their job. Well, I didn't understand until I had gotten that degree. I was like, Oh, oh. now I know why this is important. You know, you've got I these see. accrual basis of, a, you know, you've got, inventory management, you've got these things and okay. So I was able corporately to have a much better relationship and communication with, with my accountants there. Mm. All of that serves me with the IHS. I would um, imagine so. Yeah. I would have figured it out. I had used QuickBooks in the past. I was the treasurer of the Atlanta wind symphony. We used QuickBooks, mm -hmm. but knowing that there's a lot more gotchas involved. Um, and mm. knowing what rocks to look under, or at least having a better directional idea of what rocks to look under, because it's my responsibility to look for those gotchas to protect this organization. Right. And those skills that I learned from my MBA, um, together with all of the regulatory F FRA, the F Federal Railroad Association, you know, like dealing with hazmat materials that are being shipped, all of these rules and regulations and troubleshooting. Um, is a huge part of my career. I, I have to look for problems and fix them. It mm -hmm. trained my brain to, to, to work in that manner. And so do I, am I perfect with the Horn Society? No, it's a totally different <laughs> animal, completely different animal, but I know to ask questions, you know? Right. And so it's, I know where I need to reach out and get help. Or I know, you know what, this is not a big deal. We don't need to worry about this. You know, I have a, I have a good starting point with things like that, that mm -hmm. I got from my corporate career. No, that's, that's really cool. Um, so you mentioned that you're a very uh, active amateur horn player. And I always tell, I, I teach music history as well as, as well as horn here. And I always tell my students when we talk about like historical figures that were quote unquote amateurs, it's like amateur doesn't mean you aren't 
a capable or even really, really fine musician. Amateur just means you do it because you love it, not because you get paid for it. So there's this connotation these days of, well, amateur means you're maybe not you know, at the certain level. And that, that couldn't be further from the, from the truth. There are some amazing amateur players and it just comes from the word, meaning you love what you do. You love mm-hmm. playing the horn. So mm-hmm. I think it would be cool for you to talk about what your experience as an amateur horn player has been like in the IHS and how the IHS is, you know, part of our mission is to be a society for all horn players, not just a certain kind or career or whatever. Yeah. Thank you, James. You know, this is a hot button with me. Um, (laughs) I uh, try to play my horn as much as I can. It is obviously not my first um, priority, but it's a very high priority. And I, until Muncie, Indiana, had never been to an international horn symposium. Now I'm getting all the horn calls. I'm reading all about it. Looks Mm -hmm. great. Looks like fun. But over the years, when I have to decide, am I going to spend my vacation time and my money to go to this symposium? I don't think it's going to be worth my time because I am not a student. I am Mm -hmm. not a professional. What's what is this going to be a good use of my time and resources? I don't understand what this is. It's not for me. Looks Mm -hmm. great. Looks great. Have fun, hornists. Um, (laughs) But it's not for me. The reason why I went to Muncie is because I was interviewing for the executive director position. They were doing them in person, um, the final round, if you mm-hmm. will. Fortunately, I'm geographically close. I drove down from Toledo. I stayed with family at, at, in the area. It was great. It was a great week. Uh, the interviews were on the Sunday before the symposium started. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. I had made the decision, well, since I'm here and since I can stay with family, I'm going to register for the whole week. I was so mad at myself for all of these years of missing all of these symposiums. I really thought about LA and I really thought about Brazil, Mm -hmm. but I didn't go. And I cannot stress enough that a symposium, whether or not you spend the whole week, there's options for multiple days. And I swear this isn't a plug for it. I'm just telling you my (laughs) experience. I was so inspired and so energized by the performances, meeting people, the the uh, oh boy the exhibits hall <laughs> did I spend yeah. some money there? <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> um, because there is something for everyone at these symposiums. You get so much energy in life. The music that I bought alone, I still play. I have a pile of it on my floor next to my horn, mm-hmm. and I and I just pick it up and I play. I wouldn't have been. I didn't even know about half of the music vendors until I bought music from them. And so so I cannot stress enough that that if you are a non-professional, non-student, non-teacher person, there is something for you at a symposium. And by extension, the Horn Society has so much to offer. On the website, there's, uh, well, all the horn calls, for one. Mm -hmm. You can go and read them all. There's history. There's connections. There's so much information um, just on the website, if you mind that. And then we have the regional workshops um, that you might be able to leverage, especially now that things are opening up a little bit more mm-hmm. now. It's just, the, or or are you curious, do you have a skill that you, uh, because you are in corporate America or you're, you're an accountant or a lawyer or a nurse or something, and you, you might think that there's no place for you at the IHS. I promise you there is. Mm-hmm. Uh, I will not exploit you if you volunteer for me. I want you to get something out of it. And when I say volunteer for me, I, I work very hard to make sure that it's a, a very um, mutually beneficial relationship. I want mm-hmm. you to be happy. Um, there's so many things that, that we can do as an organization to do more with non-professional, well, I'll just call them amateur players. Mm-hmm, um, sure. And, and I don't think that we trumpet that loud enough we don't toot our horn enough about mm-hmm. that that there's a real place for amateur players and the the symposium is one way to really enjoy enjoy being a horn player with other horn players it's it's a wonderful wonderful thing but the, yeah. the horn society itself oh that's another thing with the horn calls what i used to do um i would the first part of the horn call that i would read was the music and book reviews and the cd the cd mm-hmm. reviews And I bought a lot of CDs um, Mm -hmm. and and a lot of books that way. And that's what kept me going as a player. 
Mm-hmm. It's just, you know, really leveraging these resources that are there. Maybe I didn't get as much out of the more academic articles, um, the historical articles I love. You know, I would read everything, literally, cover to cover, everything in that book I read. Um, this organization is for amateurs. It is for students. It is for, for professionals. But I think it's an underserved demographic. Mm-hmm. Well, and I think you mentioned the the benefit of going to the the symposium. It's, it's a window into the society as a whole. You're going to see people from all over the world at these things. Now, granted, depending on where the symposium is, it's going to be heavily weighted towards people that are closer, closer than others. But yes. I mean, there are people that come from all over the world to yes. these symposia, no matter where they're held. Right. And you're going to see people from the age of, you know, junior high school or high school age with their parents, all the way up to, you know, retired professional players, retired, you know, uh, business people, and they, they're all carrying a horn, and they yep. all are, are interested in, in the same thing. And I think knowing that 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 bond is what brings everybody to that place at that time for those yes. few days is is really special, and you're not you're not really going to find that in too many other uh, places on 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 this planet. So I agree. I mean, I have all my conferences and things that I've done for my corporate life, and they're great, but it's not the same feeling. It is Mm-mm. it is not the same, and coming to a symposium, even if you only can give a day or two to it, I promise you, it will not disappoint. It's, it's 100% worth it. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> um, so to the extent that you want to talk about them, are there, you mentioned the uh, sort of a retooled mission statement and goals for the society, but are there other kind of uh, current or, uh, you know, pending initiatives that you're excited about that you think the, the membership or anybody listening to this podcast would be interesting in hearing about? Well, I will say that one thing that I don't know that our membership knows about is that if there are any policy changes or ideas or questions, a member can bring that to the advisory council. Mm -hmm. Uh, We want to hear your voices. Uh, We want you to be participatory in, in what, in the business that we do. So for our meetings in the, in the summer, our advisory council meetings, were when we do the bulk of the of the work, um, I will post on Facebook and in the e-newsletter that if you have any business that you would like the AC to consider to write up a proposal, it doesn't have to be more than a paragraph or two. It can be as detailed as you'd like. Um, you know, I'm not talking about a dissertation here. When I say <laughs> proposal, don't let that, you know, right. and, and email it to me. And then if I have questions, of course, I'll get back to you. We had some policy uh, proposals regarding hosting an international symposium mm-hmm. th- that came through last year that we were able to consider and discuss and vote on and made a change to what we think will benefit future hosts of symposiums. Mm -hmm. Like it was an absolute cause and effect. We received the proposal. We talked about it. We voted on it. Now there, it was kind of subsets and we did some of them wholly. And some of them we did with slight amendments to it. Mm -hmm. But anyway, you can affect change in this organization. If you just Mm -hmm. tell us what's on your mind. Um, So I don't know if there's anything specific. That mission statement was a really big deal to us. Mm -hmm particularly the the values um of course my, i'm drawing a blank on on things now that you've asked me that question that's okay well i mean we can always <laughs> plug all of the scholarship commissioning you know the composition contest I, I i think those are things that it's easy to again and i was guilty of this too before kind of getting to know a little bit more about how the society runs i just got my horn call every 4 months and i was like okay i that's the ihs but it's so much more than just the horn call it's all of the stuff on the website it's the commissioning uh programs, Mayor Ramon, and then the major uh, solo work commissioning. It's mm-hmm. the outreach. It's the educational side of things. I mean, it's it really is a, a whole world unto itself. So while there might be certain aspects, if you're a member of the IHS, there might be certain aspects that you're less interested in. There's going to be something that you're yeah. interested in. Yeah. The, the, the pure amount of new music that's being generated as a result of our programs right there for Horn, 
Mm-hmm. Right there is is thank you for for mentioning that James the the composition contest that we have every other year. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's a winner in one of two categories. There's so there's two categories, two winners: virtuoso and um, featured, mm-hmm. something like that. And the the works that come out of that, and then we do honorable mentions, and those works are then performed usually, if we can, at a symposium so that you can hear them. Mm-hmm. Um, we have our um, online music sales, which has so much horn music, arrangements for horn, new yes. music for horn, um, t- tons of stuff up there if you're looking for horn music. Um, the commissioning assistance program is so valuable. It's not going to wholly provide a commission for you to commission somebody to write something, but it'll help you along mm-hmm. your way as you're finding sources of income Um for new works for horn or or some small ensemble, you know, things like that. It's really important. Um, These are really great. I'm saying really a lot. I do that all the time. (laughs) These are great programs um, to generate music for the horn and by extension support these composers that are doing amazing new things. Mm -hmm. Um, So yeah, those, and then our scholarships and our awards, we have our premier soloist award competition at our symposium. So there's a first round where you send in a tape and it's judged anonymously. And then Mm -hmm. if you make it to the next round, you, and I can promise you it's anonymous because I go through and I scrub all the metadata from those. (laughs) Yep. Uh, I spend a lot of time scrubbing. And so it is anonymous. Um, And then you perform at the symposium and there's monetary awards assigned to that uh, if you get first, second or third place. Mm -hmm. We have the Mansur Award for to support uh, people who want to who are more writers. Paul Mm -hmm. Mansur is an editor of the Horn Call. And so this support that you get a a lesson with a, a featured artist or a advisory council member. There's all these things that we have. The the Hawkins Scholar John Hawkins Memorial mm-hmm. Scholarship helps pay uh, up to fifteen hundred dollars for you to go to an international symposium. Yep. The Tuckwell Award, Tuck well. yep. yep, they that that pays up to five hundred dollars to let you go to any workshop where you could be studying with um, a, a hornist. You know, it's mm-hmm. so there's a lot of, of these programs out there that just facilitate trying to help support getting expo- a, exposure to a broader horn community than you might have in your immediate area. And yeah. cannot stress enough, the, the website is up to date. All of the, the deadlines are there. The criteria for the uh, scholarship program are all there. And you can always reach out to me with questions. Always, always. Yeah, well, that's great. Um, I guess maybe it – and thanks again for talking to me today. This has been <laughs> awesome. Um, love, love. And this is going to be a tough question to, to answer, but uh, – so – I'm sure you're like me, super excited about going to uh, the first in-person symposium in in a few years. Is there anything like, you know, if you had to make a top three list or top top list of what what's what's the thing you're most excited about uh, when when we do the uh, go to the symposium in Texas? Is there something you're extremely looking forward to? Maybe even more than all of the other stuff. I just really cannot wait to see people face to face. Yeah. I think that Zoom has been an amazing means to an end to stay mm-hmm. connected with people. Uh, I'm a natural introvert. I, I don't mind staying in my house. Um, but even still, I cannot wait to see people because having gone to Muncie and then subsequently having gone to Ghent, it, Ghent was my first symposium as executive director. Mm-hmm. I absolutely feel that this is a family reunion. Mm -hmm. This is 100%, even if you've never met the person that you're sitting across the table from right now, you are now family. That energy, that unconditional love, that unconditional support, I think we all need that in our our lives. Um, I have been lucky to be able recently to go to some live performances, and I'm Mm -hmm. going to see the Canadian Brass tomorrow night. All right. Um, That said, having some live horn music um oh you know what you know what's so great is when you're walking around a symposium and you hear people who just got together and they're in a corner of a parking lot playing duets or trios or quartets you know they just (laughs) having that that organic exuberant horn thing Mm -hmm. i cannot wait i don't care that it's in texas in august july yeah (laughs) 
<laughs> I cannot wait. I think that's those are my two favorite things mm-hmm. that I'm looking forward to the most is that that organic the well seeing people and then that organic just let's play our horn because yep. we love to play the our horn. I- impromptu, yeah. Yes quartets and stuff awesome thanks again julia this has been really fun my pleasure james thank you so much for asking me